So in terms of positive black identity, I think I'm still not sure on the screen. Um, we have examples, of course, with Kendi making the speech he was ashamed of, Malcolm conking his hair. We have the example that, looking back on the example of Malcolm X talking about gambling and talking about the white boy that ripped him off and Malcolm X's use of the term the white man that, according to Kendi's definition, we could say is a racist idea. He keeps saying the white man is, and the white man um, deals to our people from the bottom of the deck, etc. So according to Kendi's terms, Malcolm X has racist ideas about white people. If we are very literal about what Kendi says and about what Malcolm X says. So, I'm going to ask you, first of all, um, how might we argue that Malcolm X is not, in fact, racist toward white people, per se? I'll put the question over here in the chat, too. And another way of asking that question is, what does he mean when he says, I'll turn the, I'll, sh I'll quiet myself down and you go ahead, sir. Uh, he's not racist towards every white person because he's, when he's saying things like the white man, he's talking about institutions and organizations such as the government, the military, the police force, things like that. Institutions such as the ones that when after his father died, they were unable to collect when his when his father's life insurance policy because they were able to lie and say that he killed himself. Even though that made no sense when they already said he got saved by a car. Institutions such as those that had continually done things that were antagonistic and he seemed to lie and lie. Institutions such as the family that took him in. And once he started acting in ways they didn't like, they were ready to get rid of him. It's, it's, it's not every individual, such as the way that, they, that we talked about last class, with the with the you know with when it's a when it's a so-called bad egg, they're able to get individual, but if it's a so-called bad egg in the black community. Black community are moderate, so they have to disavow them fully, or those views are shared by every black person. So he's not he's not viewing what, when he's saying the white man, he's not viewing every white person as the white man. But when he looks at the people that are in control and the people that make these decisions and the people that do things that end up hurting him and his community, he sees white men at top. He sees white men in control of these people, in control of these organizations in control, period, especially in the United States and around the world at this time because there's a lot of colonialism and imperialism going on and a lot of uh, 
a lot of war going on and taking over, destroying and taking over nations and stuff. And people that look like him, he sees in a lot of these things. He's talking about, uh, which war was it? This time? This was World War, World War II. World War II. World War II. Mm -hmm. He's seen, he may not see it now, but when you talk, when he's talking about the white man, he's, he's already grown and learned more and looking back at his time. He looks back and he sees how after rural Africa played in World War II, where a lot of war took, a lot of war that we don't talk about took place on that continent when it really had nothing to do with Africa. A lot of the fighting was between European countries, mm -hmm. European countries. Right, and fighting over African resources. Yes. Also during his lifetime, the anti-colonial movements that would create free independent nations in Africa took place. But let me back up a little bit because you made two, re two really interesting and important points there about Malcolm X's use of the term, the white man. Um, the first point that I think I heard you say is that very often when um, white supremacist ideas about black people or racist ideas about black people come into public discussion, they're discussions of what one individual has done. So, O.J. Simpson murders his wife and suddenly all black men are dangerous and violent, right? So that kind of scapegoating collapses the entire culture and millions of men into the one, the one person who become, becomes this, the um, example of the entire race. So when Malcolm X says the white man singular, he's doing the same thing to the so-called white race that the white race typically does in the media to African American men. And that's a really interesting point because as a rhetorical strategy, he's letting white people know how it feels to be a problem. By repeatedly saying the white man, he is like a mosquito in the white man's ear. And that, yes, upsets individual white, ma white men who say, oh no, it's not me, I didn't do it. But then you also add to that point that there is colonialism, which was primarily a white project, a European project, and especially in Africa. Now, if we think about China and Japan and Korea, Vietnam had a French colonial influence, but there are colonial issues in China. There still are today with China and, and Tibet, which has a different name now. I'm being really bad on my global examples. But um, long story short, you're saying that he is using the term the white man as a metaphor for the institutions like that insurance company, for the governments and the colonial, colonial authorities that exploit Africa, and also policies and traditions within white supremacist culture in the US. So number one, he's flipping that rhetoric of scapegoating and one black person being a problem. W.B. Du Bois is a problem because he's a black man. Number two, uh, there's this metaphorical or kind of apart for a whole, I think it's called a synecdoche, synecdoche, um, in which meaning that one black person stands in for all black people. And one of your classmates, Celine Crittenden, who is an online student, brings that up. She says, first of all, in her paper, that racism is about power and policy, not about people. However, um, policies and laws related to racism from Jim Crow in the southern part of the US and the voting laws in the South are policies that people had to support. So although a white person in the South may say, I don't support these policies, if they didn't do anything to stop it, then that makes that white person complicit because they are still voting for George Wallace. So I think what Celine, kind of what Celine is saying and what Ibram Kendi is telling us is you can't say, well, I'm not a racist. I love my maid. And I'm being facetious here about the movie The Help right? A lot of white people claim to love black people if they're in their place. So I'm not a racist. I love my maid. No, nope, I don't have a maid. I'm kind of putting on a show here. Um, I'm a white Southern lady who I don't know what I would do without, you know, these ladies who raised my children for me. 
And yes, I voted for George Wallace. I don't agree with him calling in the National Guard and being so nasty, because I'm not a racist. I love black people. No, that's not allowed. If you don't um, do a recall on George Wallace, you are participating in racist policies. So as a white man or a woman, you are still complicit. And I think Malcolm X is asking people to think about those things. And there are so many examples that he gives of white people trying to do the right thing, but not really knowing how in the early part of the book, but more so in the later part of the book, in his transformation, he talks about universal brotherhood so much that it becomes pretty impossible to call him a racist. So yeah, here are some choices of how we can, you know, think about this question of what Malcolm says about the white man. Let's see. Whoops, wrong thing. I was looking for the actual text within transformation. So give me a second here. I, I think out of these choices, I think you could argue that four and one are related. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Argue. <laughs> okay, so like, out of the choice of race. Sorry, go ahead. I said, out of the choice of race. Uh huh. If you look at it, I think, I think one, two, and four are, kind, are all intertwined in a way that three is. Because as an individual white man, you can do, you can do everything in your power to support minorities, to give them resources they need, and all of those things. But when it comes to four, which is the teacher, I think that is a part of the institution that Malcolm is talking about as the white man. I think, I think that that his teacher saying that you know, when he told him what he wanted to be, and this teacher saying, no, you should have more, some a dream is more realistic. I think that's part of the institution, I think that's part of that institution or that metaphor. I think the idea that automatically the teacher, no matter what, Mal Malcolm could have said anything other than something like a janitor or a garbage man, or something along those lines. Anything other than that that Malcolm would have said, his teacher would have gave him that same response. He could have said he wanted to be a teacher just like him. And his teacher would have given that, and that's part of that, it's, that's part of that institution, part of that idea that at the time, black people had but so far they could be. There was only so much they could be and that it was the institution's job to make sure that was that stayed true. Mm -hmm. And his teaching was playing his role. Mm -hmm. That was his role. At the time in Malcolm's life, that was one of the most powerful white men he interacted with, mm -hmm. was his teaching. He had control, because if you think about it, his teacher could ruin his life at any moment. His teacher could say Malcolm did whatever, and his parents were going to believe it or the people taking care of him at the time wouldn't believe him. His teacher could fail him, even if he was turning in the best work in the class. Mm -hmm. So that, that, those two, those, it just jumped out to me when I, when I looked back over it. It jumped out to me that those two are one and the same. I'm with Pain in the Neck Book Company won't give me an actual paper copy. And this is also on Blackboard. So I was, what I'm trying to do here is look at the chapters where he go, where he has his transformation, and those are the last four chapters. The first one um, we see a lot about in One Night in Miami. And did you say you had seen that? You still haven't seen it? Oh my goodness, that is about his, there's a lot in that about his breaking from the Nation of Islam. And they put a price on his head when he leaves the Nation of Islam. So it kind of seems like his assassination could have been a Nation of Islam assassin. I personally think it was 
I probably shouldn't say this in the recording, but I think it was the government. And then, and it, it's not impossible that the government had connections with the Nation of Islam, too. They, the government had agent provocateurs in the Black Panther Party and, it, you know, for, for King and all kinds of movements. But didn't they just find out that one of the Proud Boys leaders is at, was actually an FBI or CIA? Right, and and what your what the examples are that you just mentioned are called agents provocateur. That's like a French term for a double agent who um, just causes trouble. And and so they, the COINTELPRO did send a lot of people in just to make trouble. Now today we have the media to do that for us. So um, Malcolm talks about in his time in Africa that this is in the hand in the handout part of 330 page 337 with astonishment I heard that the American press carried stories that my Beirut speech caused a riot what kind of riot I don't know how any reporter in good conscience could could have cabled that across the ocean the Beirut Daily Star front page reported my speech mentioned no riot because there was none. When I was done, the African students all but besieged me for autographs. Some of them even hugged me. Never have even American Negro audiences accepted me as I have been accepted time and again by the less inhibited, more down-to-earth Africans. So, you know, the, the point there is exactly the kind of example you were talking about, though, that Malcolm X is now in Africa causing riots, causing trouble. Then he does talk about um, the colonialism in Africa. He goes to Nigeria, and the Nigerian professor is the author of a book about black nationalism. The doctor says that I knew that the New York City press was highly upset about a recent killing in Harlem of a white woman, a white woman for which many people were blaming me at least indirectly. An elderly white couple who owned a Harlem clothing store had been attacked by several young Negroes and the wife was stabbed to death. Some of these young Negroes apprehended by the police had described themselves as belonging to an organization they called Blood Brothers. These youths allegedly had said or implied that they were affiliated with black Muslims who had split away from the Nation of Islam to join up with me. 
So going back to the idea of the scapegoat, right? Here he is in Egypt on a religious journey talking about the brotherhood of humanity, the brotherhood of man, having a conversion experience of love and kindness. And the New York City Press is telling stories about some kids who murdered an elderly white woman and blamed it on him. And you know his rhetoric is responsible. Do you want to add to that? I'm going to jump in again here while you're just letting that sink in. Um, so, you know, Malcolm's response is yes, all black men and women are blood brothers. We're all, you know, there's this, because he returns to the idea of pan Africanism. And he mentions that um, Jewish people worldwide often have a connection to Israel and have that sense of. a haven or a safe space in Israel at the very least in response to the atrocities of the Holocaust. And so Malcolm's idea is that the atrocities committed against African Americans need to go before the United Nations and the United Nations needs to condemn American racism. Similarly to the way that the United Nations decided to create Israel. So yeah, that's kind of a little bit all over the place. But um, when the, the black nationalist aspect of this is that he wants African nations to support African Americans. So he's looking for not a sense of nationalism based on being in the United States or being in Lagos, Nigeria, or being in Be Beirut, or being in Egypt, rather. Excuse me. He's looking for a sense of black nationalism, meaning that just as the people of the Jewish diaspora have spread throughout the, the world, and there are Jewish people all over the world, black people have also had this diaspora, this um, sending out and dispersal throughout the world, and there should be a connection. So he says it's time to develop a working unity in the framework of Pan-Africanism, which is kind of funny because W.E.B. Du Bois and Pauline Hopkins and many of their cohorts in 1900 have the first World Pan-African Congress. And Pauline Hopkins, as the editor of the Colored American magazine, had Africans writing for the magazine. And she wrote about Africa. And Freedom's Journal wrote about Africa. So Malcolm X doesn't necessarily go into the history of <laughs> Pan-Africanism here when he says, hey, we need the framework of Pan-Africanism. But he knows about Marcus Garvey. He, he, I'm sure he, when he was imprisoned and reading everything, he read Du Bois. Du Bois died in Ghana. He meets. Even though when he was younger, he disagreed with him as he grew older. And he was part of the 19. Go ahead and turn your mic on. I was just saying real quick how W. Du Bois, when he was younger, he disagreed with Pan Africans because he had more than an American African. Full focus. Not saying he didn't care about Africans in the diaspora, but he had more of a uh, as when he was younger. But as he grew older, he became more and more pan Africanist as he realized this is a global issue. As he started looking at, as he started looking and learning more about things like imperialism and colonialism and neocolonialism, he started learning that this is a global issue because it all looks the same, even if the flag on top is different. Mm -hmm. And so. It even got to the point that in the 19, it was early 19, before 1950, in the early, early before the early 1900s, there was a Pan-African Council to decide the definition of true Pan-Africanism, and W. B. Du Bois was a major contributor to that conference. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 it's not the exact same because, of course, W. B. Du Bois wasn't like Malcolm when he was younger, but it. It was a very similar growth in mindset, how Malcolm grew from how he thought and how he viewed the world 
when he was younger to his older years, which is of course way different because the mean boys was in his nineties when he died. So but that that shows how this had from generation to generation how W. E. Boys got onto it when he was older, and how the next generation after him, being without him, he got onto it when he was even younger. Yeah. <laughs> also, there was a similar um, a similar change that happened even from 1830 to the 1850s. Frederick Douglass, who hopefully we all learned about in school, had a good friend and Frederick Douglass and Martin Delaney founded the North Star together. Martin Delaney said, hey, I kind of like this idea of going to Nigeria. I'm going to go and travel around and think about possible exit strategies. And Douglass disagreed. Douglass thought the Constitution and the United States would work for African Americans. And so Du Bois and Delaney kind of had a split. I'm sorry. Douglas and Delaney had a split. However, when the Civil War happened, Delaney became um, a, a major executive in the Freedmen's Bureau. So, you know, seeing that he had the chance, once the, there was a chance for things to work out in the United States, Delaney did focus his attention back on the United States. But Douglas went to the White House and insisted that. Lincoln recognized Haiti as a nation. So there's kind of a lot of movement back and forth from national US strategies to global strategies and the kind of growth and movement and ideas of how to best find freedom. So we have two minutes left. This is a super long video that I should have cut out, but these fill in the blanks you can do multiple times and these are some of the um, really key phrases and some of the most important anti-racist um, phrases that we see in the latter part of the book and so you can see the answers here because it's my teacher copy the racist psychology nourished in the white man And it's actually someone in Africa who's, who says to him, the American white man isn't a racist. It's the political, economic, and social atmosphere that nourishes, nourishes a racist psychology in the white man. Okay, there we go. There's the answer to our white man poll, right? But an African tells him that. Which is truly fascinating. Because of the experience of colonialism, you know, we kind of get that insight. And then conservatives and liberals, both bad news, long story short. The psychological castration in terms of calling people boy, for example. Um, the call for imagination, for new ideas, for doing things differently. So that's certainly an important part of his transformation. It's white people who have to get to work. He's saying exactly what Kennedy says here. If you want to be an anti-racist, you have to start now and you have to do things to fight against racist policies. Malcolm X says the same thing. If you want to stop racism, if you are sincere, you get to work. And I love that. Steve Biko says something kind of similar in South Africa a few years later. So um, not that I want to talk about white people all the time, but what I'm trying to talk about here is anti-racism and about the fact that black nationalism and white nationalism are not the same thing. Because black nationalism always says, and hey, talk to your people. Help us out here. We want this universal humanity, but it's not the job of only the black diaspora to accomplish that. White people have to work and participate. And here is Maya Angelou, among the people that Malcolm met in Ghana. 
Maya lived as an expatriate. Du Bois lived as an expatriate. James Baldwin lived as an expatriate. Um, this is just a, a little bit of the exchange between Malcolm and Martin, and it's 1021, and before someone has a nervous breakdown about my dog wandering around the campus, I will let you all um, go on to your spring break. Thank you again.